Got some beer. Some good brute chuck. It's on a house. <laughs> okay, so for those who might not recognize it, and I hope there's not too many of you, that was a little clip from the outlaw Josie Wales with um, Clint Eastwood, of course. Um, and what, if you're like me, um, that probably, that reference probably went past you the first time you watched it. Probably the only people who might know anything about it were in Oklahoma. And what it is, is it's a reference to chalk was Choctaw beer. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because it's, um, it's something I only came across a couple of weeks ago, but it's a fascinating topic. Um, it's, um, well, I, I won't describe it here because I have with me um, Professor Steve Sewell from the University of the Mainland in Texas. And um, he's the, like I said, Professor of History, and he wrote one of the, the main articles on, on this and did a lot of research on it. So, um, Steve, thanks a million for, for taking the time. My pleasure. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe what we could do is, I'm not quite sure where to start this. Maybe it's a good place to kind of set the the time and location of where Choctaw came from might be the the best way, because it's it, it arose in the 19th century. In the 19th century, the Choctaw Nation originally was in the southeast United States, around Mississippi and parts of Alabama. And of course, then they were forcibly removed out of the Indian Territory, which today is Oklahoma, in the 1830s. And they started to brew Choc Choctaw beer there. And then in about the 1880s, uh, or late 1870s, coal was discovered in that region and a thriving coal industry developed and about 10,000 miners came into the Choctaw Nation to mine the coal and they quickly adopted chalk beer as their favorite beverage and it, it just started from there and uh, you know, typically the Choctaw Nation was dry. There was a complete prohibition of alcohol there. And then they, so they started making up excuses on why they needed to drink chalk beer. They said it was, uh, the water was disease ridden. The only way to make it safe and to drink would be to turn it into beer. Kind of like uh, St. Arnold said way back in the 1500s, you know, yeah. don't drink water, drink good beer. I think people have been and, using that excuse for a long time. A long time, yes. So they uh, made it into beer, and then they also claimed that the water was so hard there that you needed to, it was full of minerals, which it really was. They, but you could make it palatable by turning it into chalk beer. So they were always coming up with new excuses for making beer. Okay, so um, yeah, just come back, because like I said, the Choctaw are not from that area originally. Do you know, were they brewing beer um, in, their, in their original home? Or they they brewed it in Mississippi and Alabama when the tribe was still located there, okay. and then they brought that beer culture out to the Choctaw Nation in what today is Oklahoma, southeast Oklahoma. Okay, and the and brewing... then when the miners came in, they just quickly adopted it themselves. Right. And the brewing style, I guess, I, I don't know how much of this. I know you have a lot of history on like where where it went, um, but the techniques and stuff like because most of North American beers were probably brewed with corn or some maize before that mm -hmm. so but this is not this is kind of more of the european style brewing this it beer. was uh, the primary recipe was barley hops uh, a little bit of tobacco they would throw tobacco or snuff in there for flavoring and then they would also throw in these uh, berries called fish berries and uh, the choctaw indians also used those to catch fish they would throw it out on a creek and basically it paralyzed the fish and they would come up to the top and then they would harvest the fish. So I'm, you have to be real careful on just how much fish berry you added to it. or <laughs> uh, A little too much might just knock you off right then and there. But almost all the recipes refer to these fish berries being put in there. But I never could find the exact amounts of each ingredient. It would just list the ingredients. Okay, okay. And then really, that's just the basic recipe that others would use corn, others would use wheat. Uh, it's still sold today in Krebs, Oklahoma at a restaurant turned brew pub called Pete's Place, and they advertise it as a unfiltered wheat beer. Okay. So it's kind of this umbrella of different yeah. berry recipes. 
and everybody would just flavor it depending on their personal taste. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like, you know, what it was was essentially an American farmhouse ale, something like, mm -hmm. if, if you look today, even today, like Norway has a has a living farmhouse tradition in Lithuania that where it's just they're, they're brewing their beer in for their farm and then maybe selling it mm -hmm. somewhere on commercial. But that sounds like what it was like. It's the same kind of brewing techniques, the same mm -hmm. overall Choctaw beer would be kind of just an overall umbrella for mm -hmm. for everybody else's beer. Yeah, uh, hang on for one second. Let me mm -hmm. make some background noise here. Okay. Uh, they would brew it in their houses. These are guys that are living in, com in company towns where the mine owners own all the houses. They own the mine. They own the company store. These guys are not even paid in money. They're paid in script, only good at the company store. So they would brew this beer on, on the side to make money and just to have it available. Okay. And those people, sorry, just to go back another step. Um, so the, the Choctaw, by this stage, like, the 1880s, 89s, it had moved away from just being an exclusive Choctaw. Oh, absolutely. And when the, the coal was discovered there, these basically coal barons moved in and signed agreements with the Choctaw Nation. And the Choctaws, they never mined the coal themselves, but okay. they uh, got royalties off of it and actually became quite wealthy off the coal mining. But because it's in Choctaw Nation, the federal authorities really didn't have any jurisdiction there. So these coal barons are super powerful guys in, in that region. And the Choctaws basically let them do whatever they wanted as long as they got their royalty checks. Okay, so... And then these miners would, you know... Well, actually, it's their wives, for the most part, that brew the beer. The men are down in the mines, so the women were the main brewers. Okay, and the, the miners then, were they, where did they live? Were like, were they in town or did they have a, a kind of a farmstead that that's where? Uh, these were classic company towns where the, the, the baron would lease a small area from the Choctaw Nation and then right there where the mine was and they would throw up these little cheap little houses. I mean, really cheap little houses okay. and everybody lived in these company towns. Right. And then they would brew out back and okay, okay. So they just buy it. So, so they weren't producing their own grains and hops that they were. Oh no, producing. they were they were buying the grains. Okay. Yeah. And I, I suppose the question is, okay, it originated with Choctaw with the Choctaw Nation, but that name stuck. Why? The name you... stuck. Everybody always called it chalk beer. Uh, a lot of these, almost all the miners that came in were from Europe. They were Italians, Poles, Russians, uh, Welsh, people that had some coal mining experience. And they would come in and they had this beer drinking tradition. And they just, as soon as they discovered chalk beer, they they embraced it. Right. And yeah, I guess I'm still trying to understand, you know, the, the, that phrase chalk beer. And I, I know it's an umbrella. So is there any... Were the miners using, like, I'm, I'm trying to understand, is there a, a specific technique or ingredient beyond poison fish berries and stuff <laughs> that, you know, that kind of defined it, or did it just no, became... I think it was, it was pretty crude production. I mean, they were probably brewing it up in sheds, in kitchens, in garages, just anywhere you could brew it up. Right. I mean, it wasn't professionally made. In fact, when I was in my 20s, I worked in data processing, a third shift, cut off it eight in the morning and I was in a car with this guy worked there and we stopped at some bar that he knew knocked on the door at nine o'clock in the morning. And of course they were closed and he came out five minutes later with a gallon jug of chalk beer. And that, that was in the 1980s. And I just remembered having about a half inch of sediment at the bottom of the gallon jug. So you never drank it down to the bottom. You left a little at the bottom. It was, okay. it was all that yeast that had settled into the bottom. And yeah, so yeah, because I came across a video when I, when I knew I was talking to you, I came went doing a little search, and I came across a video that was just um, I think it was the Oklahoma, um, I don't know, some Oklahoma newspaper had done a thing on on Chuck, and they had their their brewing their beer reviewer brewed up a, a batch he'd gotten from 
he'd gotten the recipe from someone. So it did live on well into the, the 20th century as a kind of oh, a... Oh, absolutely. Like I said, this guy was able to get a gallon of it in the 1980s, basically out the back door of a bar that they were illegally manufacturing it. So it's still part of Oklahoma culture to this day. Uh, this Pete's Place in Krebs. Krebs was a tiny little town of about 400 people now. It was bigger then. And I uh, one summer, I spent a whole summer in that region cataloging these old coal mines for the State Historical Society. And this little town of three or 400 people had six Italian restaurants, which was, you know, it's the vestige of that, all those Italian miners that lived there. And Pete's Place was the a, a restaurant this guy named Pete owned it, and you could get Choctaw beer there all the way up into the 1920s illegally. And then as soon as it became legal in the 1990s, they turned the restaurant into a brew pub, and you can buy chalk beer there legally today. In fact, uh, here's a little glass oh, from that place, chalk beer company from Pete's Place, and it says since 1919, but uh, actually it goes way back. Okay. okay, yeah, because sorry, just go back to that video I, I saw because the technique struck me as like, like I'd mentioned before, like about this being very farmhouse. It was a very much uh, in this case, he had a relatively low amount of grain, um, mm -hmm. mixed in the hops in with it into a bag and just kind of steeped it like like a like tea for, yeah. for an hour and then, um, then didn't boil just moved it it was a raw ale and it just moved straight into fermentation after i cooled it down and fermented mm -hmm. so would that have been typical of how they do it? that's typical of how it was done sometimes they would brew it up in these big crocks like a 10 gallon big old crock and they they would brew it up in that and then uh, they just would boil it on a stove and then let it cool off and then let it ferment for a couple of weeks and then they would pour it off and sell it off it went for like in the 1920s like 25 cents a quart it was really cheap right yeah and the 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 strength varied wildly it typically was around five percent alcohol yeah. but then uh they found out if you double the ingredients you could double the, the alcohol the abv on it so they would do that and then they got into a big huge legal fight with the, the authorities on whether it was legal or not, and they dropped it down below 3.2% and then called it non-intoxicating. <laughs> and, and then they uh, went through all these different court battles. Uh, technically, it was illegal to introduce alcohol into the Choctaw Nation. So they got a court to rule that, hey, this is legal stuff because we're not introducing it into here. We're manufacturing it here. And then, of course, the courts would come back and they'd pass another law saying manufacturing is illegal. And then they would say, well, this is actually a tonic. It's not beer. And they <laughs> renamed it over and over. Uh, they called it a mead sometimes. They called it Rochester's tonic. Uh, they, in one point, they called it mist. And they called it Uno. They would just say one step ahead of the law by changing the name. And then... They would say, oh, it's not intoxicating. And then the Department of Agriculture would test and say, typical beer, 5%. Right. So, so yeah, so there's one big question that comes out of that is they, like, this was a very dispersed, very local industry. There was there was no one dominated it in any way because it was... Oh, no, no, not region. at all. There's not like an Anheuser-Busch or some <laughs> powerful beer trust running the show. So you, it was just... Local people brewing up beer for themselves and for the, the people of that particular community. It's a bit, I, I suppose it's a bit like, or is, am I right, like kind of moonshine? It's but... very similar to that sort of style. Uh, because the women did most of the brewing, because the men are down in the mines, the women would run all these chalk bars. And they when they would crack down on them and arrest them, there was two women they arrested that were in their 70s and uh, talked about a newspaper, them being shy girls. And there was that old TV show called The Waltons back in the 70s. And there was two women on there that brewed, they, they called it the recipe, the, their moonshine. And 
when I saw that in that newspaper article, I went, it sounds like those two old ladies on that TV <laughs> show. Yes, but it's kind of an underground culture, is what it was. Yeah, and and that's what I guess I was coming to. Like, I mean, if I think of that kind of moonshine and running moonshine and that, you do think of it as being embedded in the culture, whereas oh, this is exactly the same. So, yeah, and so like that. This so it arose. It's not really a. It, by by the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, it had really no relationship to the Choctaw anymore. It was just called uh, Choc. No, it was still called Choc. That's just where its origins was. Yeah. Uh, by that point, these uh, coal mining people are producing it and drinking it themselves. And like I said, that Oklahoma was it was illegal at that stage, or at least in the, the Choctaw Nation, it was illegal. Mm. So they, like you said, they were trying to not introducing it, and they were rephrasing and they were renaming it. How do they? I mean, how how did they have, or who had the nerve? Like when, when someone was brought to court, you were going after a small, relatively poor person. So, yeah, were they going after lots of people at one time? How did it get into a co a big court case that someone would then try and change the name? And well, uh, the authorities found out over a period of time that they could generate quite a bit of revenue by rounding these guys up and finding them. And uh, I looked through all the court records of this period, and they start to look more like accounting ledgers and court records that the authorities realize we can make some money by kind of tolerating this industry, rounding them up once in a while, fine them, get some money from them. And then they would typically they would be fined 30 days at a dollar fine. That was a typical, typical sentence. So, you did your 30 days, you paid your dollar, then you went back and just did it again and again. But there were a few people, a couple of cases got all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. So there was people that were a little bit more deeply involved in the legal aspect of it. And then they finally got the court to rule that uh, this was not. In, there was a big battle over. You could enter. It was illegal to introduce spiritus liquors to the Choctaw Nation. And they said, well, no, this is a malted beverage. This isn't a spirited liquor. So they had some pretty good legal minds <laughs> throwing up some arguments that kind of stay one step ahead of the law. But but who was paying for those then? That's what I, I guess I'm trying to understand. If it was all a lot of small individuals, who would fund a case all the way to the Supreme Court? Uh, I don't really know the answer to that, but they managed to get to the Supreme Court a couple times. Okay. And so then they would play off different courts off each other that uh, there was a judge in Texas that had jurisdiction over the southern part of the Choctaw Nation along the Red River, and he ruled that uh, you could, these malted beverages were not illegal, they weren't spiritus liquors, and then over in Arkansas, you had Isaac Parker, the famous hanging Judge Parker, he ruled they were illegal beverages. So yeah, and then then you would appeal it up to the Supreme Court because you've got these uh, contested rulings on which judge is right. So then it would just work up through the court system, right? And, and then so Congress would constantly revise the definition of what was illegal. They would add beer, they would add malted beverages, and then the chalk brewers would come right back with, "Well, this is called a tonic. This isn't beer." or this is called Mist, or this is called Uno. They would constantly change the name of it to try to say a step ahead of the legal process. Right. And, and yeah, so if, if there was going, if someone was calling it tonic, then presumably, and they thought they got away with it, so everyone else copied it, but it was, I'm trying to figure out the, no, I'm thinking, um, like the would have been, was there anyone who was doing this on a kind of a larger commercial at all, like that had a brand, like was there anyone you'd know that, you know, would you just buy chalk from your local neighbor or would you be looking for chalk from a certain person? Like, would there be anyone who had a bottle with a label on it? No, there's nothing like that. It's there's no large scale production. It's all small scale production uh, done like by women of these little coal mining towns to supply the, the miners. OK, so how did it become so well known that, you know, it became chalk and it it was obviously known, it seems like, wider than Oklahoma. I mean, if you look at oh, yeah. well, mm -hmm. you know, how, how did how did the name Chalk expand out that way? 
to, to cover it the whole just, of the West. It became such an integral part of the Choctaw Nation culture, and all these thousands of miners are embracing it, and then it just kind of just spread through word of mouth more than anything else. Right, so it, it just became, yeah, Choc just became the name for beer, basically. Yep, basically that was it. Mm-hmm. Right. This illegally brewed, home-brewed beer. Right. Uh, I guess what think about this. So, if on areas that weren't, um, you know, where where beer was legal, um, which would be outside the Choctaw Nation, outside Oklahoma, but people still called beer chocolate. Would there be? Was there commercial brewing, large scale brewing out out in those areas? Do you know? Uh, like a brand that would be known. Well, by the time you got outside of uh, the Indian Nation, it was legal. So you had quite a bit in like St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee. Uh, but chalk beer really never spread beyond the borders of the Indian nation. I'm just wondering like uh, uh, on those areas, if they were, if people were asking for chalk and there was still Budweiser available at the same time, you know, what? what no, it's really I mean, more of a local culture thing. It really right. never spread beyond the Indian nation. Okay. 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 Um. So, yeah, so, so, what happened then during, I mean, during the 20s, during Prohibition? Well, it, it, well let me back up just a little bit. Okay. Uh, when Oklahoma became a state in 1907 and the Choctaws lost their sovereignty over that area, uh, it was state prohibition, so it really didn't change anything. And then, of course, you had national prohibition in starting in 1919 with the 18th Amendment. And they just kind of kept on going because they had always been underground anyway. So whether it was a state law or a national prohibition or, or whatever, they had always been brewing this in this underground economy. So they just kind of kept on trucking in the 1920s. And then of course, national prohibition ended in 1933 with the 21st amendment. And, but even then uh, Oklahoma was still a dry state, but then they, legalized 3.2 percent beer saying it was non-intoxicating of course we drink enough of it it is intoxicating yeah, you think- can't drink more uh, and then finally 1959 oklahoma legalized uh liquor okay and then you had this really weird thing where you had you could buy beer and liquor at the liquor store but you couldn't order a drink at a restaurant or a bar they were all bring your own bottle which was basically to placate the, the 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 Baptists that dominated Oklahoma. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I mean, if this was because I I have no idea about Oklahoma society or or that, but is there a big divide like between those who were very if it was a dry state, and yet it sounds like everybody was brewing beer. You know, where's yeah. that? <laughs> who who, well, was, yeah. who was dominating that? That it should be dry. It's kind, what, yeah, it's kind of a. It's, divided society you had these deeply religious deeply conservative people who dominated the, the state legislature so they had statewide prohibition but then you had the other half of the state drinking chalk every night so <laughs> in coming out of this underground economy right and and you were saying that they, they were basically yeah I, i'm still trying to wrap my mind on so there was one group who wanted to who wanted everything completely dry another crowd who the other half were just drinking and brewing away and they were trying to enforce the dry laws but they saw it as a source of revenue at the same time so they presumably yeah. didn't want like who who was getting the revenue from it then was that going to the state government to the, was going to the state government okay and uh like they like i said these court records in the 1880s, 1890s looked like account ledgers. I mean, they were using, they were clearly using it to generate revenue. In fact, uh, I was thinking this morning when I taught at Oklahoma Panhandle State, a member of our department was uh, uh, part of the Rotary Club and asked me to give this paper at their monthly meeting. So I went into Guyman, which was where the county seat was, and at the Rotary Club meeting, I'm giving this paper and when I started talking about the authorities using it as a revenue generator, this one man got a big scowl on his face. I found out later he was a local judge. <laughs> so it was kind of 
he took it personally. <laughs> and um, yeah, but you'd wonder if why they wouldn't just tax it then, you know, legalize it and tax it. But I guess, yeah, they, they had the best of both worlds this way. If you were yeah, right. they did. They uh, they had it. They taxed it, but then they still placated the the yeah. religious. And did a lot. Uh, did a lot of people go to jail, like? For this, were, were a lot of people locked up. Oh, yeah, jail? quite a few people went to jail, but the sentences were typically thirty days. Still, I'm thinking like if they're small, small families, and like you said, it was many that the women were were doing the brewing. Then you're, you know, it sounds, it's tough. Like you're taking you're taking them out oh, of the family absolutely. for thirty days. I did find where one guy got sentenced to ninety days, but I'd never found a sentence that was more than that. So mm -hmm. it was just kind of this gray world of we know it's illegal. But we can tax you or we can find you and make some money and they just weren't going to stop drinking chalk beer there was somebody who was going to be brewing it and you could get it uh one way or another uh this one i found this one where they raided this woman's house and she said well i'm brewing this beer because the doctor ordered me to for my sick daughter but when the when the authorities came in there was about 15 men there that, all claimed to be doctors and they were coming in to check on the, uh, the sick daughter and then the Indian agent said well I'm pretty sure these doctors are practicing without a license <laughs> so there's kind of this this like I said this culture that developed around it everybody drank it the authorities just they could not find a way to stomp it out because they weren't going to stop drinking chalk beer so there's kind of this uneasy situation where they just kind of tolerated it to some degree and when they were brewing this presumably not every house turned into a into a saloon or something so they must have sold like maybe maybe one per i don't know every 10 or whatever i, I have no clue whatsoever yeah. but would they have sold then into this central bar that then people came well, and each of these towns they called them the beer joints or beer dives and they were producing it someplace whether it's out in the woods or in a, in a shed or a garage or in the kitchen. And then they would bring it to these beer joints and that's where the miners right. would. And, and so, sorry, just, just to clarify it. So you might've had a load of people just brewing individually and then they'd sell to the central person. He wasn't, mm -hmm. kind of, he wasn't running a brewery. There was just everybody was coming and selling to him. So you, yeah, some people would just brew it and consume it themselves. Yeah. And there had to be a little bit, larger scale to supply these beer joints okay yeah so yeah and then obviously the, the only thing about that is you don't know what quality of beer you're getting when you arrive because it could be yeah. anybody's one glass could be brewed by one person and another by the next person so Absolutely. yeah so, so that's where you you come down to i suppose i mean that, that, that's the advantage that that the big brewers have now like it's the consistency you know what you're getting yeah. rather than uh, this was you might have different batches from the same brewer taste differently because they were flavoring it with different stuff. They would throw raisins in there, plums, just they brewed it based on their personal preference of, of taste. So it would vary a lot. Right. Yeah. I, I guess I'm fascinated with the, the idea that there maybe was no way to tell who was brewing it. Because if you look at, I'm thinking of places like Norway where they have the, kind of farm farm brewing traditions still going there it's very much like a farmer and you know who the good farmers are and they're you know mm -hmm. you can brew the good beer and they're very proud of it and if you brew a bad beer you get a bad name you know well that occurred here too because there were several of these women who had a reputation of making the best beer okay so and they knew who made the good beer and then they would you would go get their beer because it was the yeah. best okay so you'd, yeah you'd search that out um yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. So then, like, okay, I, I'm just trying to, sorry, I'm going through. So we went through the prohibition and it came back, like you said, a dry state. And it was finally, I think you said the 50s? It was... In 1959, they legalized everything. And then uh, it wasn't until the 1995 that they Oklahoma legalized microbreweries. Okay. And, and you have these little microbreweries pop up and uh, Pete's Place became one of them where they uh, that's where chalked on beer is still you can buy it to this day and, and they you can buy it in grocery stores 
within, oh, 40 miles of Krebs. But really, it's this very small area where you can still get it to this day. Right. You can get it at that one brew pub, or you can buy it at a grocery store or a gas station within a few miles of Krebs. But it okay. really doesn't get out beyond that. Right. And that, like I said, that, that's a wheat beer. So it, it, the, like, the, does that kind of a, a, exist in name only? Or is it how much relationship does it really have to what was being brewed there? The original? Well, probably a little bit thin at times. That it's, uh, they say they use the 1919 recipe. And the only difference is it's, quote, legal now. Right. Yeah, and I'm thinking in Ireland we have this, um, yeah, it's bootleg spirit that we've had for forever called Pachin. And suddenly that's not legal, but there's someone selling Pachin, which is, you know, it's not the same stuff, but it, it's a legalized yeah. version. And I'm pretty sure it's, you know, got no relationship at all to to what's there because because it becomes a business. Um, and you're, yeah. just, mm. you know, you're just going to reclassify. And where, so they're only brewing... Like you said, for their own brew pub in a little area around the place. Are they That's really? About it. It's very small production. Are they? Well, maybe they don't need to. I was going to say, kind of living on the the chalk name to try and you know, I don't know what I'm saying actually. I'm just wondering. Um, yeah, how how much they don't sound like they're they're trying to promote it as a traditional, you know, this is chalk beer to the world and trying to trying to use the name. They use the name more than anything else. Yeah. They, like I said, they still claim they're using the original 1919 recipe. But if you go to their website, it says chalk beer, uh, unfiltered wheat. Right. So it's which, you know, like I said, there was different versions of the recipe. So some people did use barley. Some people used corn. Some people did use wheat. And probably, yeah, whatever was available. It's whatever time. was available. Mm hmm so, um, Pete, they're not they're not using these fish berries, are they? They're not poisoned. No, they're not using the fish berries. <laughs> that got dropped out of the recipe. I would imagine that. Yeah. yeah no, and like I said, they the Choctaws use those to paralyze fish. So that's a pretty dangerous ingredient if you threw too much of it in there. I'm thinking of like curare or something like that and paralyze your lungs. You're yeah. you're dead. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose it makes it makes it an interesting night out doesn't it that you're hey, definitely. <laughs> so you like, sure that uh i don't know if it was the physiological part or it added some taste of some sort i'm not sure right. on that part right but, uh, you see it quoted all the time in all the various versions of the recipe and did that kind of disappear out from those recipes at some point in history it, it, by the 1920s the fish berries has disappeared that late yeah. i would have thought it might be a bit earlier <laughs> yeah you would think so <laughs> um so yeah i mean it's a fascinating like i said it's a fascinating topic because i i never came across this this whole culture that that kind of you know it, it's a beer culture that uh, when i did see the outlaw josie wales years ago mm -hmm. it just flew by me i didn't give it mm -hmm. a second if, if you're not aware of it you wouldn't really yeah that word doesn't really mean anything to you how well known is it? Like, is this story of this beer known around Oklahoma? Is it? Does everybody still know about it? Are oh, there yeah. people still brewing? It's if you just type a Choctaw beer into a Google search, you get all sorts of references to it, and all these various. Uh, well, the Daily Oklahoman had, which is the big newspaper in Oklahoma City, they had a story on it. Uh, just. It's it's people are still aware of it. It's part of the ingrained in the culture. Yeah. I'm not saying it's dominant by any means, but it's it's there. People are aware of it. Right, and so if people only stopped brewing it mainly, like you know, like in the the 80s, 90s, uh, it's been brewed up there, and they kind of stop. Is there a chance, like that, even with Pete's there, that this is a kind of a, a cyclical thing that people will kind of reclaim that part of the culture again and. Well, I doubt if there's a whole lot of uh, illegal production going on anymore. That it's it's kind of a bygone. People are aware of it. It still exists, but it's not a dominant part of the culture anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you wonder, you know, that 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 happened quite a lot. That people 
it nearly dies out and then suddenly people rediscover and mm -hmm. get their get their pride in what that culture was for a while that they've nearly lost well uh, choctaws uh, they became a very very wealthy tribe in the last few years in the last 20 years uh, they've there's no more coal mining in that region that, that all played out those were small seams only four five foot and just couldn't keep up with strip mining anymore but then they've uh they've got super wealthy off gambling they found this little niche where they can have gambling on their land and their sovereign right. and so and the choctaws all the tribes in oklahoma have really tried to keep their culture alive and i can't really speak definitively on whether they're keeping the chalk beer aspect of that culture alive but they're their greater culture they're really working on to keep alive. Yeah. Actually, I, I kind of have to mention this point. I don't know if you know, but the, there's this link between Choctaw and Ireland that it's always been there because of the, the famine in Ireland, you know, when there was mm -hmm. whatever, you know, half the population died or moved. Mm -hmm. uh, Choctaw had just had their, their trail of tears and they would just been moved to mm -hmm. Oklahoma and they, we still remember it, you know, that they, they had nothing, they had absolutely nothing, and yet they still raised a sum of money to send to Ireland. So it's it's always been a Yeah, they well they had you know, they were called one of the five civilized tribes, which was kind of uh, they were civilized because they had intermarried into whites and adopted a lot of white culture and became very successful businessmen. And like I said, now they opened a casino a few years ago and in a, uh, a big hotel next to it, where they just built a $150 million hotel expansion and paid cash for that hotel, okay. cash. And then they all the Choctaws get free college education, free health care. So the Choctaws are a very uh, successful tribe. Right, well, they've come a long way since they helped us out anyway. So a long to... ways from the Trail of Tears, no doubt yeah. about it. Yeah, because they, like I said, that, that's something that it's not, you know, it's not front and center here, but people are aware and still remember that, you know, they they sent that money, even small as that, it was. That, that, I didn't know. I wasn't aware of that. That's that's a cool yeah. little tidbit. Yeah, there is. There's a there's at least one memorial um, near where I live that, you know, that that is remembering that time. Um, mm -hmm. So it's always been appreciated anyway. But um, they never sent a spear, though. They never sent a spear. <laughs> Probably would have spoiled on the way over. Yeah, well, we mightn't have been able to handle the berries, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it's a fascinating. Thing. Um, like, like I said, it's a, it's this. I guess it's outside of Oklahoma. It is a forgotten kind of story. Yes. There's mm -hmm. no one remembers it, despite it. Do you know how? Actually, since I played that bit of the Oklahoma Josie Wales, do you know how they knew about it? Like, uh, no, I don't. I've seen that movie, but I don't even remember that that reference either. So right. I'll have yeah. to go back and watch it again and see how they found out about it. Yeah, because it sounds like there, there must be someone there who went into the authenticity. You know, it's mm -hmm. really really interesting. Um, so I don't know. Is there something I should have asked you there about it? Because it, it's uh, there's been a huge amount of information, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around some of it. Um, I'm yeah, sure. I'm trying to think of it that. Um, it, you know, it really, without the coal miners, you wouldn't have this explosion of, of consumption of it and production of it. It basically was all about supplying these miners with right. beer to drink. And sorry, just, just to touch on there, you said they were mainly from Italy. May, say that again, please. The, those miners were mainly Italian. Um, well, really, from all over Europe, there were yeah. Italians, Poles. Russians, Welsh, Irish, uh, the Indians themselves, they never mind at all. They just, you know, write us royalty checks. We don't go into the mines, <laughs> <laughs> which was pretty smart because those mines were very, very dangerous. I would imagine. Uh, there was a lot of uh, mine explosions. In fact, I, uh, when I was cataloging all those coal mines. I had an old 1930s map of where the mines were. And there was a big explosion in Krebs in 1892 that killed over 100 miners. So I found, I tracked down where uh, the mine had been. And basically, it was a big rock in this guy's front yard of his house. 
and this is where the entrance was to that mine. Uh, so, so the Indians were, they were smart. They said, we're not going down in there. You just <laughs> yeah. write us the checks. Yeah. So actually, the, just because I, I passed over there, Krebs, you mentioned Krebs as being the center. Is that because that was the main, like, was all the mining in that area? Well, that was, McAllister was even bigger, but for some reason, this chalk culture really got deeply ingrained in Krebs. Okay. But there was an area, of, well, basically all of southeast Oklahoma, several counties that were, had all these coal mining towns and Krebs is just the, the, the perfect example, but uh, there was lots of these little small towns where they had coal mining occur there. Okay, but Krebs but There was just about 10,000 miners at the peak. Right. So it's not giant, but it wasn't small either. Yeah, but there were small mines. There were small individuals. Yeah, they were all small towns. There was a, I was interviewing this one man that had uh, some very small mines on his property, and he said he and another guy three other guys in the Great Depression, they called them dog holes. They were basically just holes in the ground where they hand mined the coal. And uh, they were, he said they were selling it for $4 a ton and four guys. So for a ton of coal, they got a dollar. And then he said, back in the 1960s, they discovered natural gas on his land down like 10,000 feet. And he got fairly comfortable wealthy off of it and he said just imagine we were mining that coal for a dollar per guy per ton when that natural gas was down there all the time <laughs> it just took you know several decades to find it yeah and i suppose the technology to get it as well mm -hmm. um, well yeah so I, i'll just go back because i as, as you speak it, an odd idea pops into my head so yeah. i don't want to let you go just yet if i can hold, help it and um, no so the the railroads must have gone through those towns Oh, they, there was four or five railroads that crisscrossed this whole area, and all okay. of it was mined there and then shipped out of state to right. various places. And presumably, yeah, then the chalk probably went along the same routes and okay. became known. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Became known outside. And did Krebs then have this reputation for the best chalk? Or? They had the reputation for the best, and I said some of these women, individual women, had reputations as being best brewers. Right, so if you were in, I'm not sure, again, my geography of exactly where Krebs is, but if you were in the other end of the state, you might still look for the, the one from Krebs rather than if you, just around you. Mm -hmm. it, like I said, it really never got out of that region. You had to go there to get it. Okay. So, But then there's, like I said, every one of these little towns, was they were all brewing chalk beer. Okay. It was a little town called Hartshorn, and it was... Uh, there were all Russian miners there. In fact, there was a Russian Orthodox church in a, not around 1990 when I was doing the research there, and uh, they they were drinking it also. Okay, well, I'm surprised so, they didn't just go vodka. That's all. I, 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 <laughs> no, they were drinking it too. Never heard of a Russian drinking beer very much, but uh, well, there you go. they were there. <laughs> it, it was part of the local culture, regardless of what, what? ethnicity or nationality you were. You just came into this region and embraced and adopted chalk beer culture. Right. So, yeah, so, so it was a way of, yeah, kind of merging the people and making them mm -hmm. one people. So, and yeah. like I said, all these groups uh, came together into the United Mine Workers there. They had a big strike that went on five years just to get recognition uh, by, the, by the, coal mine, the coal companies. Okay. In fact, there was a strike in 1894 when the miners went on strike demanding to be recognized as a union. Uh, when they quit mining, uh, the Choctaws didn't get the royalty checks. So they just called up the federal authorities and said, take care of these guys. And the uh, federal troops came in, rounded up all the miners, threw them on boxcars and deported the strike. I mean, they just shipped them right out. <laughs> okay, and there I was. There I was singing the praises of the Choctaw just a minute ago about how generous they were. <laughs> well, when their revenue stream got cut off, they were not happy. And then finally, uh, in 1903, the mine owners made an agreement with the United Mine Workers. All the miners became unionized at that point. Okay. And then that went on all the way to the 1920s. And at that point, their, the coal industry kind of got replaced by the oil industry and the coal mining went away. 
So where I, I guess just finish up because I let you go now. Um, so if it's a home brewing tradition, the Choctaw or the Choc beer, um, where is, is there still a lot? I guess you you have your Pete's, which is now Choc and it's branded, I guess, and trademarked mm-hmm. as Choc. Is there any kind of home brewing of this style of beer still going on? Do you know around that? Oh, absolutely. Because or... uh, this morning I just typed in Choctaw beer into a Google search and I found a YouTube video on how to brew up Choc beer. Right. That could and be the same thing. They added in a, in a big crock. Right. So, so people, it, are still, people are still doing it, passing down the recipes and the traditions. Oh, yeah. It's like I said, it's not a big culture thing anymore, but it still does exist. Right. And you can buy the, the, the commercial version or you can buy some guy's backyard version. <laughs> like I said, my friend, he was able to acquire a gallon of it um, at a bar at nine o'clock in the morning because he knew who to contact. Right. It's, it's that sort of thing where it's still available. On the, in this underground market, okay. and uh, everybody's recipe is a little bit different, but it's it's still part of the culture. Okay, um, yeah. So, I mean, if anybody anybody watching this, where can they go if they want to brew or try it out? Like, are there recipes somewhere that they can go and look up, other than or just search? If you just do a Google search on Choctaw beer, I just you'll find several different uh, websites that refer to it and there's a, there's a youtube video and a guy brewing some up and then they give you even i found one where it's it gave the amounts you needed for a 16 gallon batch right okay so so yeah so you can find it. nobody's gone out though to kind of make up a, a historical record of talking to the brewers or anything it's just is still what's been passed on word to mouth at the moment absolutely just kind of okay pass on well, hand it. Well, hopefully someone will go out and search it out because it sounds like it's um, just be careful on the berries, whatever you do. <laughs> yeah, I would not, I would not put those in at all. That's not okay. necessary. <laughs> Avoid the recipes that have poison berries in them. Is always yeah, a good, absolutely. A good way to live your life, really. Um, yes. Listen, Steve, that was brilliant. Um, really, really fascinating. I, I had no idea about any of this um, beforehand. Well, so. like I said, I was working on my uh, dissertation on these coal miners. And I kept seeing these references to Choctaw beer and same way with me. I went, this is a really cool topic and yeah. uh, came back later and did you know, more extensive research on it and cranked out this article. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, I'll let you go. So um, thanks a million again for, for your time. My pleasure. I know you've yeah. got a whole other section that you've researched on the history of beer in general. So maybe at some point I can get you back to talk about just beer as a whole topic and not just absolutely that's a fascinating topic also i'd be glad to come back and do that one great i look forward to it and um, maybe after the summer some stage some stage all right thanks a million steve exactly. i'll just play out a little video here and um we'll end there thanks a million okay. again to steve well, thank and, you for uh, having me brian okay it was a pure pure pleasure i'm really enjoyed it okay thanks a million 